I'm Karen Fletcher Miller, and I've been, as uh, Joe said, I've been diving now. It's five years, but we do about 100 dives a year here in the Northwest, and I've been focusing on nudibranchs now because we live on the water near Bremerton, Port Orchard, and we can dive in our backyard. And so I can see these nudibranchs uh, right, in, right in our backyard. And so I was it's like, wow, uh, I, can, I can look at these and see what they do over the years. So that's what I'm starting to do. So, so starting and diving, the, usually you, when you first start to get a camera and you go diving, the thing that you want to take pictures of are fish. Everyone loves fish. They're big. They're really pretty. And these are some fish that you can see up here. But most of the pictures I have of fish are of fish swimming away. Because fish don't sit still. They move. And these are the pictures I get. And so if you look at the... Uh, this, this one here, this is a ling cod tail, as the ling cod is swimming away, but behind it, they're actually nudibranchs. Uh, there's a, what's called a yellow margin dorid and a red sponge nudibranch, and it's like, what in the heck are those? They don't move, they sit there. This is great. <laughs> I can take pictures of these all day long, but what are they? So what are nudibranchs? So you know these from living in the Northwest. This was on one day I saw land slugs. So these are slugs, as people who live in the Northwest know, and they breathe air. They live on land and breathe air. When the water, there are also slugs. They're cousins of these, and they live in the water. And when they live in the water, they can look like this. These are all northwest. These are all in the waters around here. They're much, there are beautiful nudibranchs down in the tropics, but I think the ones up here are just as pretty. Nudibranch means naked gill because they don't have lungs. They don't have internal lungs. They, they breathe through gills that are on the outside of their body. This is a gill on a dorid, and these are the the gill structure on a, a type of nudibranch called an aeolid, and that's how the, they, uh, they breathe, is through their gills. And the gills are on the outside of their body rather than inside, and so nudibranch, nudi, nudi means naked, and branch is gill, so naked gill. Just as a quick uh, anatomical comparison between a land slug and a nudibranch, you can see that they they have a similar shape, but on a, on a land slug, they have eyes on the ends of their uh, optic tentacles, while on a nudibranch, they have a similar looking structure, but it's a rhinophore on a nudibranch, and a rhinophore is what they smell with. So they don't see with their, their rhinophores, they smell with them, and nudibranchs have these other oral tentacles, which they use to feel their surroundings. They do have eyes, but the, the, their eyes are very small, and they're on their back, so they can only sense light and dark. They can't see anything. They can't see where they're going with their eyes. They can only smell where they're going and feel where they're going. This is um, a picture of a a nudibranch, and this is going to show you what it looks like to watch its heart beating. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so this is a nudibranch, and you can see its heart beating. So they they do have hearts. They don't have a closed circulatory system like we do. They have an open circulatory system. The blood, I mean the heart, um, pushes the blood around the entire body cavity of the nudibranch. It doesn't stay in veins and arteries. It, it, it goes through the whole body, and the heart just serves to pump the fluid, which is copper-based, unlike our blood, which is iron-based. It's uh, slightly uh, bluish. 
as most invertebrates have copper-based blood. But that um, that's, was a, something I had no idea that, I mean, I don't know why I didn't think nudibranchs had hearts, but it was just pretty amazing to see one beating. This, uh, these are the two basic t types of nudibranch body structure. There's what's called a dorid nudibranch, and it has a circular gill on its, uh, toward its back end, and um, it, the uh, anus is he located here. And this is an aeolid, which has these finger-like projections called serrata, which is how it breathes, and it's also where it stores some toxins, which I'll talk about a little later on. Uh, that's uh, part of its defense system. And the other thing, uh, nudibranchs have their reproductive organ openings on the right side of their body. So when, when they mate, they, they have to be sort of head to toe in order for their reproductive organs to meet up. I'll have a picture of that a little later on, too. But these are the two basic types of of uh, body shapes of a nudibranch. There are about 3,000 species known, but they, scientists believe that that's about half of what's out there. They're finding new nudibranchs every day, uh, especially in the, the tropics. Not so much up here, but they do find new ones, not as, not as many as, as um, in the tropics. We have about 86 species in the Salish Sea, and these are, this is an example of the, the different body types. So there's the dorid, the aeolid, and then a sub-branch of the aeolid, the, which is the dendronitis and the armina. And the armina is basically anything that doesn't fit somewhere else. <laughs> so this is the dorid. This is uh, San Diego or leopard dorid here, and you can see the gills on the back. And it's hard to see the gills on this one, but this is another example of a dorid. They don't have uh, toxic finger-like projections. They have glands around the edge of their mantle where they store toxins from the, the sponges and bryzoans that they eat. And um, so this is an example of a dorid that has what at first looked like uh, serrata. They, whoops, apologize. They look like serrata. They're sort of finger-like projections, but these are just a papilla. They don't serve um, the same, they don't serve a respiratory function per se, because there's the gill, which does uh, serve as a respiratory organ for a, the dorid. And this is a dorid that has tubercles, which are rounded bumps on its body. And I showed this picture because you can also see these lines here. And what these are are little, like, slivers. They're not glass, but that's a good way to think of them. They're, they're spicules, and they're sharp, so that if a fish tried to grab this, it would be like eating a pin cushion. So that's part of their defense, is to have these uh, spicules embedded in their in their backs because they don't have a shell they're a soft-bodied animal they have a shell when they're a larva but they lose the shell and so in this when they're an adult the only the protection they have are either the spicules in the in their skin or the ability to store and use the poisons from the animals that they eat now those spicules are probably from uh, eating a sponge then that that could yeah that could be where they where they get the spicules from. So this is the aeolid, of the other body type, and this is the nudibranch type that uh, their digestive gland goes up into the serrata, and that's how when they eat uh, hydroids that have stinging cells like anemones they can take those stinging cells and, it, and pass them through their digestive system and store them up in these sacs. These are uh, areas where they store these unfired nematocysts from the, the um, anemones and 
hydroids that they eat. And that's what they use uh, defensively to, to deter predators. Do they store enough poison to hurt a human? You know, that's a, I've, I've wondered about that. I think uh, if you didn't have gloves on, if you didn't have gloves on and uh, you, t you picked up one of these, now these are very small, these are, these are very small animals, so you might not feel it, but, but they would discharge. Um, but usually here, it's so cold, I've never done a dive without gloves, so even if I had touched one, I, I wouldn't feel it because uh, we wear pretty thick gloves because the water's so cold here. But, but theoretically, yes, they would discharge and you could feel a sting. And I believe I've heard in Australia of nudibranchs washing up and, and kids picking them up and getting stung from the nudibranchs, which is not nudibranch, it's actually uh, the anemone uh, <coughs> stinging cells that they, they harbor in there that, the, that you're being stung by. So this is uh, another subgroup of the aeolid, sodendronitis. These are just various different, they seem to look quite different from each other, but uh, they all have this is sort of processes on their back that are frilly or bumpy, and mainly the dendronitis has a sheath uh, around its uh, nose, essentially, its rhinophore. Even in this one, which doesn't look at all like the others, this is not a very clear picture, but there is a sheath around its rhinophore, and so it's part of, part of this family. So this is an example of the dendronitis, a couple of different members of the dendronitis family that are studied uh, here at, not, not on this island, but on San Juan Island. There's the Friday Harbor Labs, and they do a lot of neurological studies uh, because nudibranchs, especially this one here, is so big that its, uh, its neurons, its brain cells, are very easily distinguished and they can they can do a lot of s simple neurological uh, studies on nudibranchs because uh, the size of the their brain cells and because these two are in, are both dendronitis they share a common evolutionary uh, path so one neuron in one of them is, is the same in the other, and yet they swim in completely different ways. So they can study how that neuron in one nudibranch causes this sort of motion, and in the other, it's uh, a different motion. This is a picture of a pink tritonia, that big pink one on the left here. This is its brain. Uh, it's, it's very enlarged. It's really probably the size of a pea. Uh, they don't have really very big brains. Uh, this is just under a microscope. And uh, different parts of the brain are responsible for controlling different parts of its body. It uh, seems to have a symmetry to it, similar to our brain, in that there's a not quite hemispheres, but sort of two different sides, but they're unlike human brains where the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and the other way. And nudibranchs, it's just right and right. You know, the right side of the brain controls the right side of their body. It's not too complicated for them. And then this is the last sort of um, body type of nudibranch, which when uh, scientists can't figure out where they belong, they put it in this group. 